I'm going to be talking this morning about masculine strength, something that God places in a man and that is used in some of the ways that are shown in that video. We're going to start with a passage in Exodus chapter 1, and uh, we're going to read from verse, starting at verse 6 on through verse 14. Now Joseph and all his brothers and all the generation that died, uh, and all that generation died, but the Israelites were fruitful, and they multiplied greatly and became exceedingly numerous, so that the land was filled with them. And then a new king, who did not know about Joseph, came to power in Egypt. Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become much too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them, or they will become even more numerous, and if war breaks out, we'll join our enemies, fight against us, and leave the country." So they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor, and they built uh, Pithom and Ramses as store cities for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and worked them ruthlessly. They made their lives bitter with hard labor in brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in the fields. And in all their hard labor, the Egyptians used them ruthlessly. Actually, I misspoke. We're going to go on a little bit further. Uh, the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Shifra and Pua, when you help the Hebrew women in childbirth and observe them on the delivery stool, if it is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, let her live. The midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. And then the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and asked them, Why have you done this? Why have you let the boys live? The midwives answered Pharaoh, Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women. They're vigorous, and they give birth before the midwives arrive. So God was kind to the midwives, and the people increased and became even more numerous. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families of their own. And then Pharaoh gave this order to all his people, Every, child, every boy that is born, you must throw into the Nile, but let every girl live. Father God, as we talk about that scripture, let it open up for us the theme that you've placed on my heart today and speak to us, open our hearts to hear what your spirit has to say to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Hundred years later, several hundred years later, after Joseph, there arose a king who didn't remember him. Didn't remember how Joseph, through God's intervention, had saved Egypt, prepared them for seven years of famine and drought, and in the process consolidated and expanded Pharaoh's power in the land. This new king did not remember Joseph, did not know him. And he didn't remember then that these were Joseph's people, the Israelites, and that the land they had was given to them in gratitude for what Joseph had done. What he saw was a threat. They were fruitful. They multiplied. They filled the land. They were exceedingly numerous, too numerous for us, he said. He was afraid of their strength. He was afraid of their numbers. And he was afraid that they would continue to grow, afraid that he wouldn't be able to contain them keep them under control, that if enemies attacked, they would join the enemies. And because he couldn't face their strength head on, then he came up with a shrewd plan to deal with them. First, he made them slaves, and he put them to harsh labor. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread, Scripture tells us. And the harsher the Egyptians treated them. That was the first line of attack. But the second and the most important one was because they continued to grow, ordering the midwives to kill every baby boy who was born. His plan was foiled, as we saw, by the midwives. But even in this, even faced with this threat to kill the baby boys as they were being born, God prospered Israel. They continued to grow. Now, Pharaoh's aim in this, obviously, was to cut the birth rate by killing the male babies to keep them from growing up to keep them from fathering more children and over the long run for Israel to decrease and to dwindle but he had another plan in mind one that was connected to that and 
probably more important and certainly is for our consideration today, and that is his aim was to emasculate Israel, to remove the males from it, and to remove from it masculine strength. You see, he could have chosen to kill the baby girls instead, and in some ways that would have made more sense in the long run if you just wanted to cut the birth rate because the number of women limits how many babies can be born. But you see, Pharaoh wanted to destroy the masculine strength that was in Israel. Doing that would make it easier to enslave them, to control them, to take away any threat of rebellion against him. Probably in the long run, his plan was for Egypt to swallow up the women who were left and for Israel then to vanish as a nation. And he was going to do that. His aim was to destroy the masculine strength of the nation. That's our theme this morning, masculine strength. And I want to consider what masculine strength is and why it's important. And then to think about Pharaoh's strategy in the context of today, our own culture, and fatherhood and manhood in our own days and times. I want to start by saying that there are differences between boys and girls. And I don't think I'm telling you anything new, although I, I have to say that for myself, coming a, as a child of the 60s, that when I had my own kids, it was an eye-opener to me because I really did believe what feminism was saying at the time, that there was no difference. And my boys were boys, and there was no way of getting around it. If you didn't let them have guns, they picked up sticks and made them into guns, or tinker toys and made them into guns. And if you wouldn't let them do that, they would use their hands, their fingers. And if you wouldn't let them do that, they'd pick up a stick of cheese on their plate and use that. <laughs> There's just no way around it. Boys are boys and girls are girls. Men and women, masculine and feminine, they're different. They just are. And some things are hardwired into men and women. It's not nurture. And we call that masculinity and femininity. Male, male or female, every one of us has masculine characteristics and feminine characteristics. And there is a balance then in there that in men tends to or should tend to towards what we call masculine and in women towards feminine. There is a range. But even within that range then men and women are different and there are characteristics that you can describe as masculine or feminine. There are many things that you could say about masculinity, but at its core, masculinity is really about a certain kind of strength. You see that physically. Men tend to be bigger and stronger physically. And again, you have range. It's not always true, but in general, typically, men are. And what is true often in the physical often is true in other ways as well. So Larry Crabb in his book, The Silence of Adam, describes it this way, describes masculinity this way. It's an energy in men, a natural momentum within the heart of every man, a power and an urge to move into life in a particular way. So masculinity moves out and into things. It's a drive rather than a settling. It is outward rather than inward. It fights and it protects because men are typically the warriors. It rises to challenges. It single-mindedly pursues tasks and goals rather than relationships and getting along. Not that you don't do those things too, but there's something more typically masculine about the task orientation. It's about taking initiative rather than being passive. It's about pushing into things rather than receiving. Children need both masculine and feminine, both fathers and mothers. They need both nurture and challenge. The relational drawing in and then that kind of pushing out into the world. The father's job is the masculine job, and it's his masculine strength that comes to bear here to help children to separate from their mothers, to help them figure out who they are as individuals, 
to challenge and to push them beyond what they think they can do, to introduce them to the world he lives in and to launch them into it, to take risks, to find their place in the world. That's a masculine thing to do. And women can do that out of the masculine portion part of their being as well. But that's typically a father's job because that's a masculine job. And it was that masculine strength that Pharaoh tried to destroy. Now that strength, any kind of strength, but masculine strength, can be dangerous. It can turn abusive. And we know that. Abuse statistics bear that out. Abuse of men towards women using the strength that they have. It's not actually, when I say that strength is dangerous, or can be, it's not actually about male or female per se, but about living in a fallen world where strength rules and self rules. And the fact is that whatever kind of strength that we have, we will draw upon in that kind of fallen world to get what we want. And so women can use their verbal strengths abusively as well. But in this world, in a fallen world, the strong take from the weak, they enslave them, they destroy them. That was Pharaoh's purpose. That's what he was trying to do. But the fact that masculinity can be dangerous, that strength can be dangerous, is not a reason to emasculate masculine strength. Because God has purposes for it. He has reasons for giving it. The purpose of godly masculine strength is to protect and to defend. It is to make safe for people to live, to grow, to take chances, for people to be able to breathe within a space, knowing that nobody's going to take from them because it's safe there. That's why Pharaoh wanted to get rid of that masculine strength so that he could have his way with Israel. Masculine strength helps us to find out who we are, propels us appropriately into those challenges and taking risks and so forth. And for a woman or a child, there's nothing more powerful than knowing that there's someone who is stronger than I am, who I can't push around, who I can't control, but whose strength is dedicated to my well-being. And as I say that, I'm talking also about our relationship, all of us, towards God, who describes himself as a father and who is stronger, far stronger, than anything we can ever bring to bear. And yet who we can trust and feel safe with because we know that his strength is committed to my well-being as his child. That is what God puts into men as a masculine strength. We live in a day that also emasculates or seeks to emasculate masculine strength. We live in a society that does not much celebrate masculinity, does not much value masculinity, a culture that ridicules it and is suspicious of it, where many men choose to be nice and lay down their strength because they're ashamed of the abuse statistics and things like that, rather than to take it up, to protect and to defend. And we live in a culture then that tilts towards the feminine. We have media that actively tears down men and fathers. How many TV fathers are strong and solid? Most often they're portrayed as clueless, or weak, or bumbling about. Our education system tilts towards the feminine. Our boys grow up in environments that are tilted towards feminine values. Quietness, not much physical activity. Almost entirely female teachers, uh, especially in the lower grades. It's not an accident, I think, that it's mostly boys who get diagnosed as ADHD. And then you have things like the story recently in the Toronto Star about a school that banned every kind of ball except Nerf balls because somebody might get hurt. 
Apparently, they backed off on that. The children can now ask for a football or a soccer ball, although they may not get it. It depends. If you think about Canadian values, we value niceness. We like to be known as nice people. We'd rather be peacemakers than warriors, although if we have to be warriors, we're always proud of that. We're always proud that in the Second World War and the First World War, we could out-warrior anybody else. But in our culture today, we prefer nice. We prefer an inclusiveness that enfolds everyone so that no one feels left out and no one's feelings are hurt. Forget grades because somebody might feel bad about it. Give everybody a medal because everybody wins and everybody's special. And there's this kind of rant that's been going the rounds on YouTube of a commencement speaker telling people you're not special, you know. <laughs> and people are watching that because that's the kind of thing that we've done. Those are really feminine values because they draw together, they flatten the differences, they don't, you know, don't want people to feel hurt and so forth. And if you don't like that feminization, there really are only a few choices left. One of them is the kind of caricature of masculine strength that we call macho. And to behave like a strong man who doesn't have feelings and all that kind of stuff and, and is really a caricature of manhood. It's often abusive, shows up a lot in rap music and other contemporary music, I hate to say. It's there. Or to find places where masculinity still has space. Because we do have a few places where we kind of limit masculinity and we, and we say play over there. And it really is play because it happens in sports. That's, I think, behind the power of ultimate fighting and of mixed martial arts and, for that matter, of hockey. I don't know if you've ever thought about it before, but the violence and the aggression that occurs in hockey is completely at odds with mainstream Canadian culture. Completely at odds. <laughs> and yet there it is, and it's our sport, and we will defend it, and Don Cherry will stand up for it, and so will all kinds of other guys. <laughs> and I don't think it's an accident. Because I think that's an outlet then for something that you can't get rid of the masculine strength that we tend to emasculate in our culture. Since the feminism of the 60s, which I grew up with, we told men that they need to get in touch with their feminine side, to be soft and sensitive, relational, and to talk about their feelings. And we do that in the church, too. And so you get descriptions like this of John Eldridge in his book, Wild at Heart, that our men studied around here, where he says, Christianity as it currently exists has done some terrible things to men. When all is said and done, I think most men in the church believe that God put them on earth to be a good boy. The problem with men, we are told, is that they don't know how to keep their promises, be spiritual leaders, talk to their wives, or raise their children. But if they will try real hard, they can reach the lofty summit of becoming a nice guy. That's what they hold up as models for Christian maturity, really nice guys. He puts that in capitals. We don't sm smoke, drink, or swear. That's what makes us men. Now let me ask my male readers, in all your boyhood dreams growing up, did you ever dream of becoming a nice guy? <laughs> and ladies, was the prince of your dreams dashing or merely nice? <laughs> and then you have Larry Crabb, who wrote back in the mid-1990s a book called The Silence of Adam, and he describes that dilemma in a chapter where he talks about what does a godly man look like? Is he that broad-shouldered, self-confident, tough, successful guy? Is he powerful, committed to his purposes, able to keep in check emotions that might interfere with achieving his goals? Does he keep moving against all odds, never indulging the urge to panic or cry? And as you're reading that, you can hear, like, there's things in there that go, yeah, but, and then as he goes on, no, well, maybe not. Does his deepest enjoyment come more from what he's accomplished than from what he's like to be with? That's the traditional view that real men are tough. Tough enough to lead and make decisions and keep on moving. And there's something in that, you know. But he just, he's describing it in that macho way. But for the last 10 or 20 years, that view has taken a beating. From pulpits and conferences and through books, modern men have been encouraged and sometimes commanded to show their gentle side, to become comfortable with vulnerability and emotional displays, 
to stop thinking of themselves as superior to women, to release that part of their humanity that longs to connect more than to achieve. Men who live by God's design, so this thinking goes, are nicer, kinder, and more considerate than we thought men were supposed to be. John Eldridge would call that domesticating men. Aggression and power, those traditional manly qualities that have men out fighting the world while the ladies stay home. And you can hear how he's kind of playing with caricatures and stereotypes, are now scorned as cultural mistakes and perversions of true masculinity. And in our modern understanding, whatever is legitimate about a pioneering spirit belongs as much to women as to men, and whatever is appealing about domestic life should draw both men and women back to home and hearth. No longer, we are told, should men hunt while women knit, that these stereotypes have more to do with a long history of patriarchal thinking than with scripture, and that's the view of many today. But he says men have a hard time putting down their bows and arrows and picking up needles and thread. And the modern men's movement, now in full swing, back in the 90s, he says, um, rose partly in reaction to that, to what they call the feminization of men. And there came out of that then that notion of a wildness that, that John Eldridge picks up on in his book. And because there's something that's been lost, you see, about men and about masculine strength. That's what the conclusion he comes to. There's something that's been lost. And that's something that other people feel too. There are many men who feel like there's something missing. They don't know who they're supposed to be. It's like life is boring and what is there I'm supposed to be doing? And you find that even in some feminists, I remember reading already some 10 years ago, a feminist writing in, I forget if it was Atlantic Monthly or Harper's, saying, where are all the men? And she wrote that we got the sensitive, in touch with their feelings kind of guy, nice guys, but there's something missing. She said, I'm looking for somebody stronger. What happened to it? Well, that's that masculine strength that we're talking about. Because the truth is, a woman doesn't want a man who they, can't, who they can control or push around. And if they can, to the degree that they're able to do that, they will have contempt for that man. They need to know that there is strength there. And that it's strength that they can't bend, but that it is safe strength. And here's the paradox. Nice men often are unsafe men. They may not seem like it, but when that masculine piece is missing, that strength is missing, too often niceness hides a desire for peace at all costs. And you hear that, peace at all costs, so you pay any price for peace. Too often there's a deep passivity that won't engage life. And that frustrates their wives, because they can't ever get them to engage and it disappears in other areas too. Or a passive aggressiveness that then lashes out in sneaky ways. So you got guys who won't engage, guys who won't stand for what's right, guys who will sell out when they should fight. And I've told this story before. That's one of the first places that the Lord began to challenge me on 20 years ago. I was in a place where my wife was giving organ lessons to our two boys and they didn't like it. And they were supposed to practice and she'd be gone and I would be aware that they hadn't practiced but I would pretend to myself that I hadn't really noticed so that I wouldn't have to do anything about it. That's what's underneath a nice guy. And one of the first things that God, that God started to convict me on was that what I was doing was I was making my wife the bad guy to my kids and I needed to stand up on that and I needed to take I needed to be a man there and it would be for the sake of my kids and it would be for the sake of my wife that's the kind of thing I'm talking about and that's the paradox of nice men now there is a strategy I said to emasculate mas to, to emasculate or there is there seems to be something going on about emasculating masculinity to, emasculating manhood. 
in our day. And I would call it a strategy because behind a strategy there is somebody, there is something. Behind a strategy in Egypt was Pharaoh. And in our own day and age, there is a Pharaoh behind it. That's because if you look at the Old Testament, Pharaoh stood for the powers of darkness and of evil. And so there is a power of darkness that seeks to enslave and to destroy God's people, just as there was in the book of Exodus, just as there was with Pharaoh. And one of the ways that he does that is to try to get rid of godly masculinity. Because the powers of darkness know that godly masculinity will stand against them. They know that godly masculinity will fight for God's ways. They know that it won't sit by passively and let them have their way. They know they can't control or enslave where there is masculine strength, that it makes the world safe for people who they want to abuse. And so I believe there is a strategy to emasculate, to reduce masculine strength and to laugh at it, but to reduce it just as Pharaoh did and for the same reasons. Masculine strength is what God encouraged in Joshua. As he stood with the people of Israel on the edge of the promised land, what was it that God said to Joshua? He said, be strong, be courageous, be bold, do not be afraid, move forward, go into it, take the initiative. And I will be with you. That's the masculine strength that God was encouraging that takes the land that is necessary for that. Masculine strength is what propels also the church into mission. Masculine strength is important in our families. It's important in every area of life, including the church, because it propels the church into mission. We need to love one another. But we can't stay in a holy huddle all loving each other. And it is the masculine that steps out from that. And the broken world that we live in needs a masculine strength and needs to see masculine strength. I know a pastor who was a chaplain and who, because of the way that women had been abused, felt that we should remove from Scripture all references to male strength and things like that. He had a whole slew of passages that he once presented to a classist, asking them to consider removing. And the answer to those kinds of things, because people, you know, there are women here who have been hurt badly by men. It is not to have men who lord it over them, nor is it to have men who give up their godly strength, lay it down, and become nice, passive men. It is to see what godly masculine strength looks like and in that then to see what God looks like because God is not just a nice guy when he calls himself a father. He has strength, real strength. And he wants to raise that strength in our men, in our fathers, in our boys. And he wants it to be godly strength that is committed to him, that is submitted to him, because that's always the key. It has to be submitted under authority. And then it's safe. And so this morning I want to celebrate masculine strength as God has designed it. To celebrate men and to celebrate fathers. The masculine energy that God has put into us, as Larry Crabb describes it. The things that masculine strength does in our lives and in your lives. To initiate to stand, to fight, to protect, to launch, to challenge, to push, to make it happen. And I want to pray for God to unlock more of that masculine strength, for it to come to life in our men and in our boys as we move from being passive to active and take leadership that God calls us to in healthy ways. And I want to invite you to stand with me and let's pray together. Father God, 
I do want to celebrate masculine strength that you have put into men. It's by your design. It's from the creation. It goes wrong sometimes. We admit that. We confess that. We confess to the temptation to use it to get our way, to bully, to for ourselves. And that's why, Heavenly Father, we want to submit ourselves to you as fathers and as men. But we want to also take up that masculine strength, not be ashamed of it. And so this morning we celebrate it and we celebrate the gift of masculine strength that you have given to this congregation and to the men of this congregation and to celebrate the things that it does in our lives. And I pray that you'll stir in us places where we can see what masculine strength has done for us in your name. We thank you for it. We bless it. And we simply pray that you will raise up that masculine strength in godly, healthy ways among us. That we may be the church that you've called us to be, to pursue the mission that you've called us to. That we may be the families that you want us to be, the workplaces that you want to have, and so forth. I pray that in Jesus' name, amen. come from him, he who never changes, I'm held firm in the grasp of the rock of all the ages, all is well with my son.
Praise God.